a woman woke her husband up in the middle of the night. And she said, honey, I just had this terrible nightmare. She said, I, I dreamed that uh, I was at, there was an auction, and they were auctioning away husbands. There was one husband that, that drew $10,000, and there were other husbands that were going for in the millions. And the, at that point, she had her husband's full attention, and he said uh, to her, well, what about husbands for, like me? What were they going for? She said, well, that was the horrible thing. They were, they were bundling up husbands like you in a dozen and then selling them for a dollar. She said, some of you probably know husbands like that. Not my wife, of course, but some of you might. We don't, uh, fortunately, take dreams that seriously in our society. We have all kinds of crazy dreams. Some of you remember your dreams in technicolor and can describe them in detail, and others, like me, don't remember dreams very often. Maybe that's good. But we don't take them that seriously in our society. However, back in the Bible days, they took their dreams very, very seriously because dreams and visions were the primary way that God spoke to people. One of the primary ways, he spoke through prophets, but for many people, he spoke to them through dreams and visions. And oftentimes, he would give warnings through their dreams. If they didn't understand what the dream was, they could miss the warning that could, that could cost them their lives and it could even uh, devastate their entire country. So they took their dreams very seriously. Uh, many of you remember in Genesis 41, the Pharaoh has this real strange dream about skinny cows eating fat cows and all kinds of stuff. And fortunately, God had put Joseph in just the right place who could interpret the dream and tell him that a famine was coming. So they had seven years to prepare for the famine. And because of that, he saved the lives of millions of people. Had that dream not been interpreted, they could have failed to put away the grain and millions of people could have died. So they took their dreams very seriously. In the Old Testament, there are 116 references to dreams in the Old Testament. Now, they tend to be grouped into two main places. There are 52 references to dreams in the book of Genesis, and there are 29 references to dreams in the book of Daniel. And we, of course, have just started a study of the book of Daniel, and we're going to come in, run across one of those dreams today. Now, only 14 of those dreams are fully recorded in the Bible. But every one of those 14 dreams are initiated by God and given to that person for a particular purpose. And that's the case with the dream that we come across today in Daniel chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I'm going to warn you before we start, this is a long chapter. I might have to speed read through some of these parts here. Um, but what I'm hoping is that we're going to stop uh, occasionally and comment on this. I'm hoping that at some point as we go through this, the Lord's going to speak to each one of you as he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar through a dream. As you hear the interpretations and all the meanings of this, my hope is that the Lord's going to speak to each one of you. That's one of the reasons we put a place in the bulletins for notes. I don't know if you've ever noticed it's in there. And if the Lord speaks to you at some point, you want to write that down so that you can remember that and take it with you. But we're going to read from Daniel chapter 2, and we'll put the text up here in front of you at the same time. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. Now, we just said, re, explain why his mind was troubled because he knew that this dream was from God and that it was a warning, but he had no idea what it meant. And that's why he was very troubled by the dream. Verse 2. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever, which, by the way, is how you start every conversation with the king. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Now, notice how confident they are at this point. You tell us the dream, I'll give you the interpretation. Well, anybody can do that, seriously. You know, we can, you can make up your own interpretation, and how is he going to know if it's the right one or, the not, or it's not the right one? I mean, if there's locust in it, uh, that's probably representing your children. If there's witches in it, it could be the mother-in-law. We don't really know, but it's just, you know, the, you just, you can make up your own interpretation for the dreams, and, and how is he going to know? But... 
It's going to get a lot harder than that. Watch what the king does. The king replied to the astrologers, verse 5, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. (laughs) No pressure. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Oh, boy, he's raised the stakes now. Uh, It's one thing if somebody tells you their dream that you can come up with an interpretation. But it's another thing if somebody says, I had a dream last night, you tell me what it was. Well, there's, there's no guest room here. You know, you, you could take a wild stab at it, but you, the odds are a million to one that you're going to get it right. So all of a sudden, he has taken something that's easy and he's made it impossible. Unless they have like supernatural knowledge of this dream, there's no way they can tell him what his dream was. Verse 7, once more they replied, uh, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king answered, I am certain you are trying to gain time. In other words, he says you're stalling here because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret, for, interpret it for me. See, this is the true test from the king. If you really have supernatural knowledge, you don't even have to have me tell you the dream. It's like the, the person who goes to somebody who is a, a mind reader and a fortune teller, and, and the person says, well, what's your name? And you say, you tell me. You know, I don't have to give you any. You tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you're really from God. Verse 10. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologers. At this point, they're just whining. You know, it's almost annoying. And verse 11, what the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. You see, this This is in Babylon, and these are, are not... Jews who worship the God of Israel, these are uh, people who worship idols, and they they worship false gods. And their understanding is that the gods do not live among humans, but they don't know about the God of Israel who does dwell among his people. All the way back to the time that they left Egypt, and God tabernacled among his people and met with them at the Ark of the Covenant, And from that time on, he dwelt among his people. He was in the temple and the synagogue, and they could go there and meet with their God. And even more so now with Jesus Christ coming and sending the Holy Spirit who lives within us, we have a God who not only dwells among his people, he dwells in his people. And we can consult him at any time, but they knew nothing about that kind of a God. They said that he does not live among humans. It shows the difference, by the way, between false religions and true religions. I don't believe this lie that's so pervasive today that says all religions are the same. They all worship the same gods. If that were the case, those astrologers would have been fine. But the gods that they worshipped were useless gods. And they didn't even know the true God of Israel. And there was only one true God. So verse 12, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. We said last week that he's one of these crazy world leaders, and we have an an abundance of crazy world leaders today, and that he was the original crazy world leader, because when he got mad, he said, we'll just kill everybody. We'll kill all the advisors here. That'll solve our problems. Verse 13, so the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. And maybe you're like me, and you're scratching your head, you go, wait a minute. Daniel wasn't even there. You're right. He was still in training to be one of these wise men, but he wasn't there that day when they, when they asked for an interpretation. So you might think, why were they trying to kill him? Well, the reason is he's going to kill all of them. He's not going to dis, you know, distinguish between the ones who were there, the ones who weren't there. He's just going to kill all of his advisors, and that would include Daniel and his friends. And you remember the, the way he was going to kill them. He was not only going to chop them in pieces, but he was going to reduce their houses to rubble. 
And I think after you're chopped in pieces, do you really care about, I'm not sure, but maybe it's because of the family. Verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. I want to pay attention to Daniel here because he is not in any kind of panic as he maybe should have been if he knew all the information. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Daniel kept his cool. I love Daniel because this is a moment when he, by all rights, he should have been in full-blown panic when the word comes that he and his, all of his friends are going to be chopped into pieces and it was an, a decree from the king and there's nothing you can do about it. But he didn't. He didn't panic. He asked a question, he got, gathered information, and then he boldly went into the king. That was not something that was just done easily in those days. If the king was in the wrong mood when you boldly go into the king, he could kill you just for that alone. But Daniel was not only cool under pressure, but he was very bold and courageous. And he walked into the king, and he asked the king for some more time. Now, when the other wise men asked, were, when the king thought they were stalling, it just made him angry. But you might remember in the previous chapter, the king had a particular respect for Daniel. God, in a supernatural way, had given the king favor for Daniel. So it's not just an accident here but it's part of God's silent sovereignty where he's working behind the scenes that he gives the king favor for Daniel and give, the king decides to give Daniel some time to see if he can interpret the dream. In that same verse 19, then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, praise be to the name... Uh, I'm sorry, I jumped way ahead. Um, Okay, verse uh, 17. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are their Hebrew names. Um, he, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heavens concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Just want to point out here, he urges his friends to pray. Now, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, and he said, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. The other translation, be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, thanksgiving, offer the request to God. That's what these guys did. It's not going to do us any good to worry about our fate, but what we need to do is pray and ask God for his help. So he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven, and they prayed instead of panicking. And now we go to verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Now, isn't that interesting? Because it was during the night that the dream came to Nebuchadnezzar. And it was during the night that God spoke to Daniel through a vision. This time, he tells him the dream and the interpretation and the vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He he changes times and seasons. This praise to God is, is absolutely remarkable. It's one of the key passages in the entire book. But the first thing he says about God, he says, wisdom and power are his. He changes the times and seasons. You know, he knows that his God is the true God. The God that these other astrologers and wise men worshipped, they, they were not the true God. That's why they had no answer. They did not have wisdom. They did not have power. But his God changes the times and seasons. So what the astrologers did was look toward the stars to find the answers. But David worships the God who hung the stars and who can move the stars and the changes, the times and the season. He's worshiping the true God. And then he says something really important. He deposes kings and raises others up, raises up others. If you're worried about crazy world leaders in our world right now, this is a really important verse for you. You might want to put this on your refrigerator, that God deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. So look at that. God not only is all wise himself, but he gives that wisdom to the wise and the discerning. 
So when we pray for wisdom, we pray believing that God desires to pour out his wisdom upon us. And it's something that we should do on a regular basis because how many of us, is there anybody who doesn't need wisdom to navigate this world that we live in? So, but when we do, David knows that he gives wisdom to the wise and he gives knowledge to the discerning. Verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells in him. I thank and praise you, God, for my, of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So Daniel goes to the Lord in a time of crisis. He prays for God to do something that's impossible for man to do, and God answers his prayer. I said last week that Daniel should be our role model in this day of crazy world leaders, and he should be your role model in times of crisis. When things are hidden, when you don't understand why life is the way it is, how did you get into this situation you're in? Why does God have you in this situation and you're not getting any answers and it feels like darkness and confusion? Follow Daniel's example and totally be totally dependent upon the Lord. Trust God to do the impossible and trust God every single day as you work through this life and this situation where he's placed you. I want you to pay attention to this next section. Daniel is going to reveal the mystery to the king, and it's an amazing mystery. 24, Daniel went, then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, now he's speaking to the king, he says, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. Do you see what Arioch just did? He took all the credit for this. I found him. Like he went out searching all night long until he found somebody when really Daniel came to him. He didn't find Daniel. Daniel found him. But just typical human nature, he's going to take all the credit. And what I want you to do is see the contrast between Arioch, who's taking credit for something he didn't do, and Daniel, who doesn't take any credit whatsoever. He refuses to take credit. You'll see it all in this next passage. Verse 26. The king asked Daniel, also called Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replies, no. (laughs) I mean, there's more to it, but isn't this amazing? Daniel says, no, I I don't have it. I mean, if Daniel had just stopped at that point, this book would have been very different. Daniel says, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. I think if if I were Daniel, I would have had a nice dramatic pause at that point as the king starts to get really upset because Daniel just basically said, there is nobody on earth who can tell you what you ask, who can answer your question. Then he has the, the rest of the sentence, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He basically just said to the king, I can't do it, but God can which, by the way, should be our answer to people all the time when they ask you for things. Can you pray for this? Can you do this? Says, I can't, but God can. Let's go to God and ask him. So that's what Daniel did. He, Daniel says, he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. And here he is. He's going to tell the king exactly what the king saw in his dream in verse 29. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries, that's his name for God, the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else. Look at his humility here. Not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not from human hands. 
It struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Have you ever had a dream like that? <laughs> That's a dream, isn't it? There's a lot going on in that dream. A lot of detail in that dream. Can you imagine? Put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's place for just a moment. You had that amazing dream. And this young kid, Daniel, who we figured is now, even after trading for a while, he might be 17 years old. This young kid comes in, and he not only tells you the dream, he tells you in exact detail everything that you dreamed the night before. Would you just be absolutely blown away by that? Well... What it, we also understand why the king was troubled by the dream. The thing that really troubled the king was the rock. He had this big, great statue. You know Nebuchadnezzar, later on, he'd build a huge statue of solid gold to himself. Everybody would have to bow down and worship it. So he was thinking, probably, this statue is me. I would think his only question is, why isn't it all solid gold? Why is it just the head? Why we got bronze and, and iron and clay and all these lesser metals here? Why is the, but, but then he's going, well, what's the deal with the rock? Where, what is this rock that's smashing my statue to, to smithereens? And, and all of a sudden, it's like the chaff on the threshing floor, and the wind comes and blows away, and, and my beautiful statue is suddenly just gone with the wind. Hey, that would have been the better title for this passage, I think, Gone with the Wind. So Daniel explains this to him, and he's going to explain to him that there are five kingdoms in succession that are going to rule over Israel. Now, we now know what those kingdoms are because at the time he, he told Nebuchadnezzar, the only one that we knew about was Babylon. That was present. He's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar through his dream that God has revealed that after Babylon has ruled, Persia is going to conquer Babylon and Persia is going to be the next one to rule. And after Persia rules, then Greece. And after Greece rules, then Rome. And then after Rome, there's going to be another kind of mixed up version of Rome when they mix other with, with other countries. And these are going to be the five kingdoms that are going to rule over Israel in succession. And all of that's revealed by the statue with all these different parts. And after all of that, there is a stone that's going to represent Jesus Christ. And the stone is going to smash all of these kingdoms and it's going to establish a kingdom that's going to live forever. That's the interpretation of his dream. And that's what he's going to explain to the king. Verse 36, you'll see how he does it. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the fields and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. Now, so far... I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar is liking this interpretation. You're the head of gold. You're in charge of everything. But notice that Daniel is really clear. He says, the God of heaven has given you the dominion. He has placed all of this in your hands. So even as he is telling Nebuchadnezzar how powerful he is, he is reminding Nebuchadnezzar that all of that power has been given to him by God, that he did not accomplish this on his own, that God is the one who has all power and has given it to him. Verse 39, after you another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. That's because of the metal in every one, as it goes down the statue, the metal is always uh, an inferior, less expensive metal all the way down. He says, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. That one is very interesting, by the way, because this one of bronze is going to rule over the whole earth. Now, late, now we know as we look back at history that that was Alexander the Great and the bronze part of the statue represented Greece. And Alexander the Great would indeed rule over the entire earth, but he wouldn't do that until 250 years later after Daniel interprets the dream. This is from God. God knows the future and he knows what's going to happen 250 years later that this kingdom of bronze, Greece, is going to rule over the whole earth. Verse 39.
finally, there'll be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, it will crush and break all others. And guess what the iron kingdom is going to be? That's Rome. Rome was known as the, their soldiers were the iron legions. They had iron chariots and they had iron shields and, and they were a, a, a nation that was so powerful they just destroyed all other nations and they too ruled the, ruled the entire earth. And then verse 41, just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some strength of the iron even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not return, remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. He's talking about this kingdom that happens after Rome had been defeated. They relied upon other countries and made alliances with other countries to try to regain their strength. And now they were a mixture of other countries along with the iron of Rome. And that's the description of the toes and the mixture of the clay and the iron. And, and God described that hundreds of years before it would take place. Verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will, it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. The rock that broke the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold to pieces. Of course, that rock is Jesus Christ, who will reign forever. And he's cut out of the mountain by God, not by human hands. He's the rock that is described in Psalm 118 as the stone that the builders rejected that becomes the cornerstone. He's often referred to as the rock. And here... Hundreds of years before his birth, he's described in this vision. And then Daniel says, The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Look at Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to Daniel's interpretation. I don't think there could be any other reaction than this. The king Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered an offering, an incense presented to him. Do you see what he's doing? He is worshiping Daniel. He's treating Daniel like a god. He's falling on his face before him. He's offering incense and offerings to him. Now, he knows that it's Daniel's god who provided the power. He's going to say that, but he, what, how else could he react? Because... What he has just witnessed was a supernatural display of the power of God in telling him his dream and the interpretation. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Do you realize what just happened? In the brief time that it took Daniel to tell him about the dream, this, Lord had a, I mean, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a complete change of heart. Instead of believing that he worshipped the true king and that he should rename Daniel and all his friends so that their names reflected the worship of his gods, he now knows beyond a doubt that it's Daniel's God that is the true God and that his God that he's worshipped his entire life is utterly useless. And now he realizes that this is the true God. Can you imagine one of our crazy world leaders today doing that? Like some missionary having a few moments with Kim Jong-un or one of these and telling him about Jesus and all of a sudden having him just fall on the ground and, and say, Jesus is, the, is Lord of all. It's just almost impossible to imagine today. But that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. In a moment, he came face to face with the power of God and he completely surrendered and fell on his face and worshipped him. Now, he's not a full-blown believer yet. He's still going to do a lot of crazy things. But later on down the road, God is going to really get his attention and he's going to recognize it and come to proclaim God as his God. Verse 48, then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of its wise men. So the king did keep his word. He said there'd be great rewards for the one who interprets. But do you notice the similarity with Joseph? Joseph interpreted the Pharaoh's dream, and the Pharaoh makes him basically the prime minister of all of Egypt, in charge of all the grain and all the people and everybody. And this king does the same thing with Daniel. He puts him in charge of everything. 
all in charge of all the wise men. And then look at 49. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these are the Babylonian names of the same three they mentioned earlier. He appointed them administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. I would just want to point out about Daniel because he's so impressive. He didn't panic. He prayed to God. He, he was humble, even though God gave him this interpretation. And he didn't forget his friends. He didn't seek any glory and power for himself. It was given to him. And when he received that, he thought about his friends. He didn't forget about them. And he said, you know, these men should be honored too, and they were. He's very he's just impressive in so many ways. So this was a, a long chapter. And I just want you to think about the, the impossible task that Daniel was given to tell the king his dream and the interpretation. And then I want you to ask yourself, what impossible challenge are you facing right now in your life? What are the things that you're facing where you just have no answer? You have no understanding because it's hidden. It's a mystery. The future to all of us is a mystery. We do not know what tomorrow brings, what next year brings. And because it's hidden, we're often afraid of it. We worry about it. We worry more about the future than anything. We waste an awful lot of time worrying about the future. I want you to think about how maybe you can follow the example of David with that mystery in your life, with that impossible challenge that you're facing of going to the Lord and, and seeking his guidance and trusting him to walk you through every step through the valley of the shadow of death to go through that. I think there are three great lessons in this passage. And, you know, as a pastor, I am required by law to get three no more, no less lessons out of every passage. Uh, so there are three great lessons in this passage. The first one is that a crisis will expose the futility of man's thinking. There are a lot of people who are super wise and they have, they've got answers for everything until their life falls apart and then they've got no answers anymore. And maybe you've been one of those people. When life is going well, you've kind of got it all figured out. And then when life falls apart, you've got nothing. You are totally in the dark. And man's thinking is just that way. It's very limited. But also man-made religions are useless. They, people might enjoy worshiping other gods and, and other religions, and they might argue that their religions are just as good as yours, and they're all the same. We all worship the same God. But you put them in a crisis, in an impossible situation where they need supernatural wisdom or power, and their religion is all of a sudden useless. It cannot deliver because there is only one true God. But the impossible situations that show how useless the other religions are, they also show how true our God is. Those impossible situations remind us the fact that we worship the God who is wise and powerful and gives wisdom to us and can do miracles in our lives. We've all seen it before, and you'll see it again. So trust him in those impossible situations. That's lesson number one. The crisis exposes the futility of other religions and the reality of Christianity. Lesson number two. This one may seem out of left field, but evangelism is the work of God. God can bring anybody to their knees to declare him to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He did it with Nebuchadnezzar. He will do it again with Nebuchadnezzar later on. He can bring anybody to their knees, but only God can do that. Daniel couldn't have just uh, by reasoning with Nebuchadnezzar, couldn't have brought him to this place. I've had these situations many times where I argue and try to convince and persuade somebody to become a Christian, and I get nowhere. But there's other people where God has already brought them to this place of surrender, and I just mentioned to them how they can receive Christ, and they said, let's do it right now, I'm ready, I'm ready. But evangelism is the work of God. He just sometimes uses us to be either the messenger, either we plant the seed, we harvest, but... It's he's the one who does the work. By the way, speaking of evangelism and dreams, this is a little bit of an aside. I had heard reports before that there have been many Muslims who have come to Christ in the last few years because of dreams. And I said that we don't take dreams so seriously anymore, but other cultures do. 
And I was reading about it online. You can Google this, Muslims and Dreams, and there's some amazing stories. I wish I had time to tell them all to you today of Muslims who were, were, they were, there was missionaries witnessing to them about Jesus Christ. And they had these extraordinary dreams where Jesus appeared to them in the dream, but it was so real that they knew that it was the real Jesus Christ who appeared to them, and they surrendered their life to Christ. So this, uh, this dream that happened back in, in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, God still uses dreams and visions, and he uses them in certain situations. Right now, he's using that among the Muslims. Evangelism is the work of God. The third big idea, and I think this is the big idea of the whole passage, is that the kingdoms of men will fade away and be forgotten. They truly are gone with the wind in the end. No matter how great the kingdom is, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, that's why he had a head of gold, was one of the most spectacular kingdoms in all of history. The gardens of Babylon and the buildings and everything that he did, spectacular. There's not a trace of it today. We all know about the great culture of Greece and the great armies of Rome and all of these wonderful things, all the power they had, completely gone, blown away like dust in the wind. But God's kingdom, like that rock that, that he talks about afterwards, becomes a great mountain and lasts forever. God's kingdom is eternal. So don't put a lot of stock in the uh, things of this earth that are going to pass away. John said it uh, so easily. He said, do not love this world or anything of this world. Don't love it. Don't crave it. Don't make it most important to you. He said, the world and its desires will pass away. That's what this chapter tells us. The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. There is one thing that is eternal, and that is your relationship with God. Put your energy, your time, and your attention into something that will last, not the things that will, that will blow away, become dust in the wind. Let's pray together. Lord, we're reminded this morning of your incredible wisdom and your omniscience, that you know all things, even things that are hidden from us. Lord, we all know, we all, we all seek that kind of knowledge because our knowledge is so limited. Help us to seek it from you. Help us to trust, Lord, that you know those things even before you reveal them to us. Help us to trust that you know the future and you hold the future in your hands. And as long as we walk with you, Lord, we don't have anything to fear. That You'll take us through the valley. Lord, I pray for each person here who is worried about the future. And I pray that this passage will, will comfort them and assure them that you're in total and complete control and that when we are faithful to you and we trust in you, that you will protect us, you'll guide us, and we will spend eternity in your kingdom. Lord, we rejoice and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing.